I'd known that, we'd get going. <laughs> All right. Song before the sermon this morning. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Taking my sin, my cross, my shame, Rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, Worthy is your name, Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name, worthy is your name, Scripture reading this morning is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. Now I want to make clear for you, brothers and sisters, the gospel I preached to you, which you received, on which you have taken your stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold to the message I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. For I passed on to you, as most important, what I have, I have also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Good morning, good morning. It is a great day to worship our God. Amen? Amen. I am so excited that you are here this morning. Happy that, uh, well, it's a happy new year, right? That's a very common expression that we hear this time of year, but I'm glad that you are all here. I'm glad that everybody uh, uh, is excited. I say everybody's excited. I know this time of year there's generally a lot of excitement or maybe some nervous anticipation at least, right, of what the new year may bring. If nothing else, maybe you're excited this morning that 2022 is finally behind us. I don't know. I don't know what, uh, I don't know what 2022 brought you this year. Uh, for, for us personally, there were a lot of high points and a lot of low points. Uh, you know, it's just one of those things. And so this time of year, there's generally a lot of uh, excitement toward what the new year is going to bring. And I'm personally excited about what the new year has, the, uh, the, the, at least the, uh, the prospect, that's the word I'm looking for, of what this new year could be for, uh, for not just my family, but for, for us as a, as a church family as well. And I'm very glad that you made the decision to start your brand new year, uh, worshiping our God together. I think that's really cool. I don't know why it is. I think that this is just really, really uh, great and, and just such a fun coincidence that we get to begin the year uh, worshiping God together. I think that's awesome. In a few moments, we're going to sing an invitation song. And at that time, during the invitation song, a couple of our shepherds are going to be in the back uh, as we become kind of accustomed to doing. If you need prayers, if you need somebody to talk to, uh, if you're struggling right now and you just want to hug, you don't have to say a word. A couple of our shepherds will be in the back. You can go and you can see them, uh, talk to them or, or not if you don't want, and you could go right back to your seat. If there's something that you want to petition somebody 
somebody that you're sitting next to, if you just want somebody to put their arm around you and tell you that, you know, I'm, I'm excited about what the new year has to, to bring for us and for you, if you need prayers for somebody next to you, uh, we encourage you to do that as well. Uh, and we can do that at that time. But before we get to that, we're going to be wrapping up a series this week that we've called The Gospel. It's that series that we've done over the last several weeks that we've been calling The Gospel. And over the last few weeks, through this course of time, we've talked about a few different things. Right? We've talked about how that gospel message is reiterated over and over and over and over in Scripture. About how God loves you and wants wants to forgive you, that there's no way that you are too far gone, removed to receive the forgiveness of God, and how much that love means to us. After that, we looked about how the gospel message is the good news, right? That's probably the most common thing that we think of when we hear the word gospel, what the good news is, and that good news is such good news because of the bad news, because you and I are sinners, and you and I deserve death, but because of the good news, we have the ability to find everlasting life through Jesus. And if you're here with us last week, last week we talked about what our relationship is with the gospel and how our relationship with the gospel goes far beyond just rules and regulations, but the relationship with Jesus Christ. And so this week, what we're going to look at, we're going to wrap it up this week. And we're going to look at this week about the gospel and what the gospel is. If you want to go ahead and open up uh, your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that's where we're going to be for the majority of our lesson. What we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at why the gospel is so important, what the gospel actually is, right, and then how that connects with our theme for this year, 2020. I'm excited about that. Probably most excited about that to get to reveal the theme for 2023 uh, for the for the Troy Church of Christ. And so, Tyler, I don't have a clicker, but it's pretty easy to follow. So if you'll just flip for me there. There you go. We'll start with this. Why is the gospel so important? What makes the gospel, what makes the message, what makes the good news that we continue to talk about, what makes that so important? So growing up in school, I don't know if any of you ever had to do this in school, but growing up in school, I had to do a lot of group projects. Uh, even when I got to college, for whatever reason, when I was in college, for some reason, my professors, the one that I decided to take, really, really enjoyed group projects. And so if you've ever done a group project, you know that there are three types of people uh, in group projects, okay? There are what we refer to as the over achievers. Uh, the overachievers are the ones that are going to take direction whether you want them to or not, and they're going to do the majority of the work uh, because they're overly concerned with their grade. Uh, and so they actually will probably go and ask the teacher ahead of time, hey, if the group doesn't pull their weight, do I still get a good grade, right? Because they are the overachievers. They're the ones that are concerned. The second type of person that you have in group projects is what I like to call the middle ground people. Okay, the middle ground people are not going to drag the group down, but they're not going to go above and beyond to offer any of their help, right? Like, they, they don't care uh, to, like, do the best possible job. Why? Because there's always an overachiever in the group that'll do the best possible job for them, right? But they're not going to go out of their way to make things difficult either, okay? And then the third type of person that you have in group projects, uh, you all probably, you don't have to say it out loud, right? But you all probably know who I'm talking about. But the third type of person is what we refer to as the anchor of the group. And not like anchor and racing, like the most important person, but the anchor is in the person that seemingly is going to drag the rest of the group down. Uh, because they understand the value of group projects in the sense that everybody else gets to do their work for them. And they're not going to do anything to contribute to the rest of the group because, quite frankly, even if the group gets, you know, a, a, maybe not the grade that the overachiever wants, it's a better grade than the anchor's going to get on anything else the rest of the year. Uh, and so they won't do anything. They won't help. They won't offer input. They're just going to sit there and they're going to do nothing. The anchor is the person that the overachiever asks the teacher about. It says, hey, if he doesn't do anything or she doesn't do it, it's generally a he. Well, let's just be honest. It's generally a he. If he doesn't do anything, the overachievers are normally she's and the anchors are normally he's. Like, there's always exceptions to the rule, but that's generally how it works. And they're going to say, if, if he doesn't do anything, is it going to affect my grade all that much? And so you may be thinking, Nathan, what does this have to do with anything? Right? Why on earth are you talking about group projects? Because generally speaking, in those group projects, what will happen is, is the teacher will come around 
And if the teacher's good at what they do, there will be a mixture of those three types of people in the same group, right? Which is why group projects for some of you are incredibly frustrating and for others are, are kind of exciting. But there's generally always one group that for what it normally it's when people get to pick their own groups. Uh, there's always this one group where the teacher will walk around the room and see everybody doing their work. And you hear the teacher go, oh, no, it's like the blind leading the blind over here. Right. Because that group is one that's falling behind. And you say, Nathan, what does that have to do with anything at all? Well, because that expression, the blind leading the blind is generally not something that you want to hear. Right, Because normally what that expression means is that you are doing something wrong. Because that expression, from the time that we've tracked it through history, has always meant somebody who doesn't know anything getting advice from somebody else who also doesn't know anything. That phrase actually traced itself back to nearly 800 B.C. It's appeared in Hindu literature and Buddhist canon, as well as the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. But it means something because as long as humans have existed... And you can track this through history, both biblical and secular. It lets us know that as people, we have looked to put our faith in something. We have looked to try to rely on something, to give us something to motivate us, to allow us something that will make our lives easier. We've wanted to put our faith in something. And so what has traditionally happened through the course of time is people will do one of two things. Either one, they will be like the anchor of the group and they will put their faith in other people. They will put their faith in other people and they will say, look, you guys are what is going to get me through this. And in a time in your life, you may have thought of when you put your faith in other people, and maybe it ended with positive consequences, and maybe it did not. But at some point in time, you've put your faith in other people. We rely on other people. The second thing that people will do, this is what the overachiever does, is they will decide that they're going to put all of their faith in themselves. And so we look to ourselves, and we put our faith in ourselves, and we rely on ourselves, and if anybody's going to get me through this, it's going to be me. Right? We've, we've really romanticized that mindset. To, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and just work. Just get it done. Just do what needs to be done and so on and so forth. But there's two big problems with that if you're going to apply that same logic to your spiritual life. You see, the two big problems with that is, number one, you and I are eventually going to die. And that's an unsettling reminder for a lot of us. This past weekend, I lost a very dear friend. Many of you did as well. If you had the opportunity to know Jared Bailey over at the Martin Church of Christ, he passed away this past week, and he left a gaping hole in people. He was 46 years old, and it was a really unsettling reminder that you and I, we don't get forever. Not on this earth, not in this life. And so to put my faith in somebody, even to somebody as great as Jared, to put my faith in somebody or to put my faith in myself, eventually it's going to go away. Eventually that's going to fall off. Eventually that is going to pass. The other part of the problem is, is that you and I are both sinners. And so if we're going to rely on each other or we are going to put our faith in each other, or if we're going to put our faith in ourselves even... What we're doing is we're putting our faith in something that is sinful, and all we really deserve in that instance, again, like we've talked about, is death. And so to put my faith in each other, or to put my faith in myself as somebody who's going to really focus on me in a spiritual way is just the blind leading the blind. That's why Paul talks about why it is so important that we put our faith in Jesus Christ, that we put our faith in the gospel. Why? Because Jesus conquered death. Because the promise that we have in him not only cannot die, but it is something that cannot and will not let us down. You see, because you and I are imperfect people, we mess up. Every single person in here, I would bet, has, can think back to a specific moment where they trusted somebody, where they put their faith in somebody, and that somebody let them down. Or maybe even something that hurt more, when I put my faith in myself, when I decided I was going to get it done, and I let myself down. You see, but Jesus doesn't do that. The promise that we have in Christ is something that cannot die, it cannot pass, and it cannot let us down. And it's because of that importance in the gospel, that we need to remember a couple of things. We need to remember because of the importance of the gospel, number one is what Paul's going to, and we're going to look at this through 1 Corinthians chapter 15, really verses 1 and 2 for the start of this, right? Why is the gospel so important? Well, it's because of that, because it cannot let us down. But because it's so important, Paul's going to emphasize a couple of things. Number one, he's going to tell us that the gospel needs to be preached. 
The gospel needs to be preached. Look if you will at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. We're going to reread these couple of verses several times, but just bear with me. It says, Now I want to make clear for you, brothers and sisters, the gospel that what I preached to you, some of your translations may say proclaim, same word there, but I preached to you, which you received, which you have taken your stand by, which you are being saved, if you hold on to the message again, that I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. You see, Paul understood the importance of the gospel so much that he tells the Corinthians that it must be preached. This is why I brought you this gospel message, is because it's so important that it has to be preached. It has to be taught. It has to be something that is given to others. And I understand that that's not an overly popular sentiment in today's society, right? Because what we've done, and research will prove this, what we've done is we've conditioned ourselves to have shorter attention spans. And I'm not saying in some way, I'm not saying in all ways that it's bad. I'm saying in some ways it's bad, in some ways that's good. But research will tell you that the average human being, right? So if you're above average or below average, you can gauge yourself by this way, right? The average human being's attention span will last 17 to 22 minutes. And they've almost directly correlated that with our, our TV shows that run, right? Uh, in fact, how many of you have not watched a commercial in several years because you just fast-forward through all the commercials? Anybody want to admit to that, right? They just watch all their TV behind time so they can fast-forward through all the commercials. And it's those little things that we've done like that, we've conditioned ourselves. And so we want less preaching. We want less teaching. That's why you all hired a fast-talking preacher so you could get out early. Like, I know, I get it, I understand but in today's society, we want less of that. And, and so it's almost countercultural. Paul says it's so important it needs to be teach, but we want less preaching. We want less Bible classes. We want shorter sermons. We want to have more of an emphasis on just my personal relationship with God. And all the other stuff is just for, for the overachieving Christians. And Paul says that's not the case because the foundation of our faith is all about what God says we should do. Prioritizing what God says we ought to prioritize. Living by His standard as opposed to our own. But if we don't know what that is, everything else that we're doing is useless. And how are we supposed to know what that standard is if it's not preached and it's not taught? So not only is it important that the gospel is preached, but it's also incredibly important that the gospel must be received. The gospel has to be received. Look again at 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2. And I want to make clear for you, brothers and sisters, the gospel that I preach to you, which you received, on which you have taken your stand by, and which you are being saved, if you hold to the message that I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. Not only is it important for the gospel to be preached or to be taught, but it also needs to be heard and listened to. I know there are several teachers uh, here with us today, but there's this age-old debate uh, about teachers and, and students, right? Is who's responsible for the learning? Right? Is it the teacher's responsibility to teach the student in the way that the student can learn? Or is it the student's responsibility to learn from what's being taught? And the answer is yes. You see, there's responsibility on both sides. The same is true for us in a spiritual aspect. Yes, it is somebody's responsibility, which by the way, the Bible tells us that's actually all of our responsibilities. It's just be there, right? To teach the gospel, to take the gospel to others. It is somebody's responsibility to be able to preach the gospel, but it's also the responsibility of those who hear to figure out and to listen and to learn and to figure out and understand how that that gospel applies to my life. What is being taught and how do I apply that information being given to me? You see, because anybody that's ever raised teenagers understand that there's a difference between listening and receiving information, right? Right? There's a difference between hearing and actually taking with you the information that's being given. Because teenagers will hear, right? I was I was bad about that, right? I could hear anything. Some some wives in here are like nudging their husbands right now that there's a difference between hearing and listening. Uh, but you, there's a difference. We can hear it, but are we listening to it? Are we taking it with us? That word there, received, that Paul uses, doesn't just mean to hear the gospel, but actually in the Greek implies that I'm going to take that information with me. 
that when I go out, I am taking that gospel message with me, which means there is a massive difference for us today to hear something preached for the pulpit on Sunday mornings and to leave and have completely forgotten everything that was said. Right? I know I talk fast and sometimes it's hard to remember everything. That's why you take notes. I get it. Right? But there's a difference between leaving and forgetting everything that we've learned and taking what we've learned, taking what we've received, and applying it to our life. And so not only does the gospel need to be preached, not only does the gospel need to be received, but because of all that, it's super incredibly important that the gospel must be stood by. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2 again. Now I want to make clear for you, brothers and sisters, again, this is the clear point, because Paul's answering a bunch of questions. This is how 1 Corinthians is laid out. He's going to address some issues, and then about halfway through, he's going to make a switch, and he's going to say, now concerning the things that you wrote to me about, answering all these questions that the church at Corinth had for him. And so one of the questions was about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he's going to say, now I want to make clear to you, meaning that there's not supposed to be any ambiguity here, brothers and sisters, the gospel that I preached to you, which you received, on which you have taken your stand, by which you are being saved if you hold on to this message that I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. You see, the gospel is the foundation that we stand on. Not just for the church in Corinth, but for the church today. It's how we know who we are and what we are and what we do and why we do it. It's the reason that we're here. At least it should be the reason that we're here, right? Not out of any sort of worldly pressure or uh, family pressure or any sort of resentment that we may get from those that are close to us, but because of the gospel message. It's that gospel message that compels us to live a different life. To live a life dedicated to God because of what Jesus did for me. And not just here, but in my workplace and in my school and wherever I find myself. I am who I am because of what Jesus has done and who he was. And that all brings us back to this kind of point that we started with. If the gospel is important enough for Paul to mention all of these things, what makes the gospel so important? Well, it's because verse 2 will tell us here in 1 Corinthians 15 It's that gospel by which you are being saved. Why is it so important for the gospel to be preached and received and stood by? Because we're saved by it. We're saved from the death that we deserve because of the gospel. Because of what Jesus did. Because of our relationship with him. Because of that gospel message. That's why it's so important. Because we're being saved by it. And you say, well, Nathan, okay, what exactly is the gospel? What exactly is that gospel that Paul is saying is so important? Well, that's going to be in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 8. He's going to go on and explain it for us here. He says, For I passed on to you as most important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scripture, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day, according to the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas and then to the Twelve, and then He appeared to over 500 brothers and sisters at one time. Most of them are still alive, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as born at the wrong time, he also appeared to me. That's what the gospel is. If anybody ever asks you, give me a definition of the gospel, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Because the gospel is this, that Jesus died. One of the most painful way possible that's ever been recorded for us in human history, he died so that he could pay that debt that you and I could not pay. No matter how much we would want to pay that, no matter how much we've lived and strived to be as good as we possibly can in the eyes of God, we cannot pay the debt that Jesus paid, but He died to pay that debt by taking on the form of a man, by putting others before Himself, by thinking of you and me as more important than the privilege He had of being God, by becoming man, even at a time when He didn't want to, He did it anyway. He died for us. But not only that, not only did he die, the gospel also means that he was buried. See, after Jesus was taken down off the cross, he was carefully examined. If you go through and you look at uh, some sort of crucifixion practices, they were really, really tedious and really, really detailed oriented, making sure that Jesus was dead. Because they knew who he was. They knew what people were saying about him. They knew what he was saying about himself. They wanted to make sure that Jesus had died. And so after they were sure, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that he had died, they decided to bury him. And they decided to bury him, not only 
in just a regular tomb, but they wanted to bury him and they wanted to put him away. And so they placed a stone in front of that tomb and they even went to Pilate to get permission because of how concerned they were about this to be able to put a garrison of soldiers out in front of his grave, which was not an a enviable task, by the way. Because those soldiers that stood outside of Jesus' tomb, they knew that if a, a man ever was not dead, and if a man ever were to leave a tomb that these soldiers were in charge of, the penalty was, well, somebody had to die. That's what the tomb was there for, was for somebody who was dead. And if it wasn't going to be the person that we thought it was going to be, it was going to be the people that let that person go. And so he died, he was buried, he was in the tomb, and that is the entirety of the story with every other religious leader, politician, good and godly person that has ever lived. But the gospel tells us that not only did Jesus die, not only was Jesus buried, but on the third day, according to the scriptures, he was raised from the dead. You see, Jesus was different than every other person who ever lived because he took care of our sin problem by paying that debt of death. And then he took care of our death problem by raising from the grave. Jesus died, was buried, and he was raised. He conquered death so that you and I could conquer death. And the last part of this gospel, not only did Jesus die, not only was he buried, not only did he raise, but then to make that gospel complete, he revealed himself to those who were still living. The Bible tells us first to Cephas, which is Peter, then to the twelve, then to the five hundred brothers and sisters. He says most of which are alive. Some of them have gone on, right? He says, and then lastly to James, then to the apostles, then lastly to Paul. Paul here is saying that this is what the gospel is, but more than that, he throws in this statement here of most of which who are still alive. He says, this is what the gospel is. He says, and you don't have to take my word for it. Why don't you talk to any of these other 500 people, most of which are still alive? Go talk to them. Go see if what they're saying adds up to what I'm saying. Because they've seen Jesus raised as well. Jesus revealed himself. Not only did he die, not only was he buried, not only did he raise, but then he made that gospel complete by revealing himself to others. Paul wants to make it abundantly clear how important the gospel is to the church at Corinth and by virtue to them, to us as well. That's how important the gospel is because of all the things that it means to us. And you may be thinking at this point, okay, I get it. The gospel is important. I understand. That's all well and good. But what on earth does that have to do with 2023? All right, what on earth does all that have to do with 2023? And it's because this gospel message directly impacts the theme for our year. And the theme for our year, because of the gospel, because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you and I are stronger together. Because we're all working for the same thing. We're all motivated by the same thing. At least we should be, right? We are all impacted by the same gospel. We all have decided to put our faith in the same gospel. We all are saved because of what Jesus Christ did for us. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9-12 through 12 says, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their efforts. For if either falls, his companion can lift him up. But pity the one who falls without another one to lift him up. Also, if two lie down together, they can keep warm. But how does one person stay warm alone? And if someone overpowers one person, two can resist him. But a cord of three is not easily broken. See, this is the focus for 2020. This is the part I'm really excited about, by the way. This is our focus for 2023. This is our theme for what the year is. If you want to be the church, it begins with the realization that you and I are stronger together. You and I are stronger together, not just in the kingdom of Christians as a whole, with those that are out in the community with us, not just with our relationship with other uh, congregations, not, but, but we're stronger together as a body of believers here. We're stronger together as, as spouses because of the gospel. We're stronger together as families because of the gospel. We're stronger together as friends, as workers, as kingdom dwellers. We are stronger together because of of the gospel. And so this is what we've got going on in 2023. We're stronger together. If you've walked through the hallway, you've noticed we've redone a couple of the bulletin boards. We've reset the prayer board out here. If you're going out this way, it's on the left, right? Some of y'all didn't know that, but it's out here on the left. We've reset that prayer board for those that are needing prayer requests. If you don't want to come forward, we understand. If you don't necessarily want to go to the back, we understand. But if you need somebody to pray for you, you can put it on the prayer board. We're encouraging everybody to use that. 
author on the right side, the bulletin board that we've redone, it says what's happening. There's a big church calendar there now that you will notice has a lot of different things on it. Not only are we going to continue to emphasize our senior saints this year, but we're going to emphasize our young adults. We're going to emphasize our youth. We're going to understand that you and I are stronger together. We're going to do things and hopefully encourage you to be a part of things that are going to build those bonds, to strengthen those relationships that we have. That's going to be out there. It says what's happening. That's going to be a bulletin board that if you've got things going on in your life, if you've got games, if you've got band schedules, if you're performing in, in a community theater, we want to know about it. We want to know what's going on in the life of our members. We want to be a part of those things. Every other month, we're going to do two different things this year. Uh, I said we've, we've scheduled young adult get-together nights for every other month, and then every other month, we're going to do something that we've called Celebration Sunday. That's what we're going to do. And that's a time that we're going to get together. Every, I think it's even-numbered months. You can go check the calendar. It may be odd. But I think it's every even-numbered month. We're going to get together, and we're going to celebrate one another. Those that have had birthdays, those that have had anniversaries, those that have had job promotions, those that are having something exciting, anything exciting going on in your life, who's had a new kid, who's had a new niece, who's had something worth talking about, no matter how little you may think it is, things are worth talking about. We're going to get together as a family to invest in the lives of one another and to celebrate those things. We're also starting next week, we'll put this in the bulletin, but starting next week, one family from here, every single week is going to be our family of the week. And what that means is, you will know, as a congregation, we are going to pray for you for the week. That will be posted in the bulletin every single week. Somebody will be there. This will be, it's just, it'll be probably small at first, but it'll just be in the same spot every single week. Right, Miss Paula, Chelsea? It'll right? be the same place every single week, right? And it's going to be our family of the week. And so our responsibility, what we want to encourage everybody to do is we want to focus on and pray for that family. Because, guys, families have struggles that nobody here knows about. And, and as much as I understand privacy, as much as I understand not wanting to air all of my dirty laundry, that hurts. It's a shame that there are things going on in our lives that we will not let other people in on. Why am I so excited about this theme is because I am incredibly passionate that not only can the church not thrive, not grow, not do great things, but the church cannot function healthily if we do not realize that we're stronger together. If we are not willing to invest in each other's lives, to have people into our homes. Some of y'all got really nervous when I said that. If we're not willing to love one another... There is no being the church. There is no expanding the kingdom. There is no Christian living if we can't learn to invest in and love each other and understand that we are stronger together. That's why I'm excited about what this year has to offer for us here at Troy. That's why I'm excited about the opportunities and all the things that we've got scheduled. Greg mentioned we've got a busy year coming up. There Again, the calendar's already full of stuff on it. And as things get closer to time, maybe dates switch around, but a lot of that stuff you can just go ahead and put on your calendar now. Right? We're implementing men's breakfast and we're implementing different groups and, and there's a lot of things that we want to get done this year. And I'm going to ask you, and I feel like I've got the support of the elders when I say that I want to encourage all of you to make, I almost made a slide, I forgot, I'm sorry. I almost made a slide that said your challenge for the year, because I know some of y'all have been missing my challenge slides. Your challenge for the year is to legitimately invest in the lives of those that are here. That goes beyond, to have a relationship that goes beyond, hey, how you doing? I'm good. That's great. And then you see each other next Sunday. The most impactful people in my life were people that understood the church is stronger together. And the reason we're stronger together, the reason that all of this is possible, is because we're all connected by the incredible power of the gospel. And so this morning, if you want to embrace that gospel message for the first time, if you want to put Christ on in baptism for the remission of your sins, or if you've turned your back on that message and there's something that you want to make right with God to live dedicated to Him once again, if there's anything that you need this morning, won't you come as we stand and as we sing?
And says my soul, therefore I will hold.